Okay, yes, welcome everyone again. Um, yeah. If you're in the wrong place, this is Bath Astronomers. Uh, so if you're after the astrologers, they're two doors down. Um, and this is our update for uh, February. Um, we're outgrowing this building, um, which is lovely. It's a lovely problem to have, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and um, just to be aware, there is a leak that the wonderful museum has always had a problem with this building since it was created, that just around here, there's a leak through that light fitting there. It's just dropping <laughs> down. Luck to the ones who yeah, so uh, <laughs> I've made you aware. <laughs> um, okay, um, yeah, uh, so actually in terms of this museum, they've got big plans to renovate it, to um, actually make it a bit more accessible, um, to really could think about um, how the whole thing is laid out. So it's been quite constrained with a very sensible decision um, that was made in the museum. Uh, many moons ago, which was keep the top two floors uh, for rental, for revenue. And that was an amazing um, uh, idea back in the uh, early 80s, because when COVID came along and all the other museums had no revenue whatsoever, this museum actually still had an income coming in there. Now, there's ways around that. Not every museum in the country died during COVID. They had tough times. And it does mean that there is actually some that were occupied by the Herschel family, which are people are currently living in, and perhaps it'd be nice to convert those. So there is a bigger programme over the next three or four years where they need to renovate the museum and they're going to get rid of that leak. Um, so fingers crossed. Uh, right, so tonight's quite special because it's not uh, a guest speaker being invited in, it's your fellow members talking. And so we've got four talks hopefully lined up, unless anyone runs away, but I can actually see them all here. So. Uh, I think we're okay. And um, here are your committee. Uh, I think the only one that's, or we haven't got Julia tonight and we haven't got Martin tonight. Um, Martin's gallivanting in uh, New Zealand. I think he's still. Uh, he sent some lovely photos from there, only slightly jealous. Uh, and Julia's off partying somewhere. I'm not sure what she's up to. There's lots of ways of getting hold of us um, via all these different uh, sources. We go over the top on the internet. Um, and uh, we currently have 117 members. But if you see any of these faces as you're walking down the street, please feel free to stop them and talk about astronomy or what you'd like, or give us feedback uh, on the club and uh, what we do. And I always put a little one-liner. Anyone spot the biggest sunspot that we've actually had in this solar cycle that was this week? 3590? Woo! Yep. <laughs> it's a picture just in case you missed it. Um, now, this is February in terms of all the outreach that we've been doing, uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> that's what's happened. Um, so a few did happen, um, but the vast majority of them are stargazing evenings and February was pretty much a washout. Um, uh, although I did manage to get to uh, Chippenham uh, on Monday. And it was a wonderful night. And so the beavers and uh, their parents and the uh, beaver leaders, they were called gorilla and things. It's like all had great names. Anyway, I've no idea what the real names are, but I've met gorilla. Um, so we actually had a, a good evening. So there, there are holes in there. And I think there's been a few astro uh, photos going around. So there have been windows. You just got to be quite patient and sometimes a uh, bit of an early bird um, to catch those. But fingers crossed March will be an improvement. Um, we've been back at um, the top of the Abbey. So we've got uh, that. We normally go up there and it's quite good for us because it's a revenue stream. Um, Astro societies often have a little bit of trouble with finances, but we've got this partnership with the Abbey. We go and run their tours on the top of the Abbey and um, that uh, generates revenue for the club, which means that we can do loads of outreach and we can buy equipment that you can use on club nights as well. So it, it's quite a nice relationship and we're back there uh, again now. We've just done two dates and we've got dates on the 15th and 22nd of March as well uh, to do. Makes it sound quite famous. Really. Uh, so there's just a few photos from up there. And this is one of the photos that one of the guests up there actually took. So not bad through a little, ordinary sort of uh, iPhone. Um, they were very excited by it, which is which was wonderful. Um, and uh, just general observing going on uh, too, so that was good. Um, 
We also had uh, our trip. So I've, I've had five or six of us, maybe that many, actually uh, pootled off to London uh, to go and see uh, the European Astro Fest. So this is my journey uh, whizzing through London to uh, go and see what was going on there. And so this is what an Astro Fest is like. Lots of stands, lots of people milling around, lots of people who start with nice cold credit cards and by the end of the night, uh, the good day, credit cards are on um, So well worth actually going to these shows. Um, they used to be a, a, a lot bigger uh, thing. Um, every single manufacturer used to be there. They used to have tons of kits, and the cheapest kit is the most expensive kit. I tend to find now it's sort of there's fewer manufacturers, fewer um, distributors, uh, and they tend to have a little bit more of the expensive kit in there. But still, definitely well worth a visit um, and discussion. And they've got talks as well uh, on various uh, sort of scientific and also practical topics as well. Um, so I definitely recommend, I think we've got the Practical Astro Show uh, coming up at the end of March, um, which is, if I remember, somewhere in the Midlands? Where is it? I can't remember where it is. Um, but they're well worth popping along to see. Kettering, that's the one. Kettering. Um, so some of those things that people have actually been doing, observing, so Paul's been observing, and uh, we've got uh, Comic Pond's um, uh, books here, Whizzing Through the Sky. Um, we mentioned Martin off in his Austra uh, New Zealand adventures. This is just an average night, <laughs> just popping outside, and that's what he sees. Large Magellanic cloud there. I think that's Canopus there. Um, and that's Alpha Centauri just there. If you ever want to see where Alpha Centauri is, it's not visible from here, <laughs> um, but it is visible from where Martin is. Yeah. And so there's a little inset there of the Large Magellanic Cloud. And the small Magellanic Cloud, if you're interested, is just off the frame. It's just out of the photo. But I was slightly jealous when I saw that. Um, and uh, Roger's been taking his photos of the sun and the moon. And this is um, uh, 3590, uh, the biggest sunspot that uh, we've had in this cycle. Absolutely massive thing. If you remember, there's 110 Earths that you can fit side by side on there. How big is that sunspot? Absolutely massive. Um, and he's got a little zoom in there. And this is what our, the members are doing. So uh, just chat to Roger, chat to a lot of people that are doing stuff um, with kit that can just be bought off the shelf. Um, and uh, with a lot of work, you have to be retired, I think, to do image processing. Um, then uh, you can get some wonderful images like this. And this is all done in, I, I, it looked like it was raining all February. Not quite. Have, have you got a seat, Steve? Stand, okay, all right, sure. Okay, so what have we got coming up? Um, we've got uh, the next event. We're not sure, because February's so bad, uh, and we're a, a cowardly coordination team, we haven't uh, fixed the night of the Messier Marathon, which is us trying to see as many Messier objects as possible. So um, we've Friday the 8th and Saturday the 9th. Whichever one looks clear, we're going to do um, on uh, and it will do it at Moncton Coombe. Um, Moncton Coombe isn't the best for horizons and things, so we're not going for 110, but we're just going to see if we get a good handful. So like last time, maybe 50 or 60 um, uh, from that site would potentially be possible. So, yeah. And that was at Moncton, was it? Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can beat your tally from last time. Um, and uh, next month, we've got Dr. Emma Curtis-Lake, uh, she came along, gosh, the year before last, um, which was just after the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, saying about all the wonderful things it was going to do. And now, two years later, she's coming back and hopefully she'll be telling us, oh, I don't know where to start. Um, and with all the research on, that's coming out of James Webb Space Telescope, that's probably going to be her tack. Where do you start? Um, the amount of data it's collected, the news articles that... Um, uh, Cosmology-defying discovery from James Webb seems to be uh, a weekly thing now. Um, so uh, hopefully the journalists eventually get bored of stories and they, they just put the big true stories down. Um, what else we've got? Um, we've got Lee Fletcher, I think it's from Leicester, and just various, and that's going to take us up to the summer. Um, so these are all professionals. We've got Pete Richardson coming in, and he's been in twice before. 
and uh, his talk back then was on his making his eight inch telescope. And the first one was uh, moving through uh, from uh, first sort of uh, creation of his grinding machine um, to make his 10 inch telescope. And then the second time he came, he'd finished the 10 inch telescope, uh, the eight inch telescope. So that was great. Actually, I think it was a 10 inch. Um, but he's he's actually embarked on a 20 inch telescope now and he's coming up to uh, finish it. He's done the mirror. So by June, we're hoping he's got the mechanics on it as well. So that's just some chap over Western Superware where his garage is taken over. He's built machines to grind mirrors and things. And he's now manufacturing his first 20 inch telescope. So the good old days of the 70s and 80s when you used to make your own. He's an Airbus engineer. It is he, what he's doing is not like the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah, the level of precision he's got, uh, you cannot, the precision he's achieving on his mirror is better than um, optical science grade. Um, but he's a test engineer for Airbus. So testing is everything. I think he just, I think, I think he enjoys it. Um, so what we've got the lineup, we've got Charles, Merrick, Paul, and we've got Steve. Let's go alphabetical order. Now, if everyone races through and we're running, we've still got time, I've got a filler, okay? And I've been doing that for four years and I've never got to speak, okay? <laughs> now, it's not, not a challenge to race through it and I don't mind, um, but just in case you do think, oh, and I've finished a bit early, it's fine to finish a bit early. Okay, right, so what I suggest is we'll hand over to you, Charles, if that's okay. Hi, okay. thank you. Um, my talk is uh, named Why Join the Host Society. <laughs> now, I might be about to ask Simon to load up my 68 PowerPoint slide, but I haven't got 68 PowerPoint slide. I'm going to talk to you instead. So, sorry about that, you get my. Um, I explain why that's my top view and later. Um, what I'll do is I'll say a bit about my own history, which is relevant, and a bit about the history of the various um, organizations here in Bath and astronomy, and then to school, but now went to university. Um, and there I came across British um, girls and beer <laughs> But I also realised that I like to consume astronomy, not produce it. Uh, I say that because what I've realised since is that many professional astronomers I know have this real urge to find something out themselves. I want to find out to know about it, but I haven't got the sort of the inner urge to be the first to discover it. And that's the key difference. So I joined the MOD 35 years, um, ended up here in Bath in 2009 and left. Got back to astronomy um, and, and came back to it when I responded to that chat with this place. Some of you may have that. Um, who was sort of guiding part of astronomy for me. And, and I helped him do that for me. And he then sadly came in and found me. And I then took over running that particular part of astronomy. There was a group of people who, in one, you know, one or two of you are here. <laughs> I'm here. So, so did astronomy in a sort of fairly, you know, uh, dummy Um And, oh, I'm not my cup, aren't I? So hold it. Okay. Um, so, How's that? Um, so that worked fine. And um, then in time, what happened is because I was running the observing bit, uh, I joined the Herschel um, Society Committee um, because they needed to have an observing member up with them. And, and I did that for a bit. And then um, the Herschel Committee itself was made of people who'd largely had been there since the thing was founded, you know, back in the 70s. And, and they could see I sort of had some experience of organizing things. Um, so they said, Charles, do you mind taking over that? So I did, 2016. So I was then organizing both uh, the Herschel uh, Society and Bath Astronomers. Happily, this chap called Simon comes along, who uh, is clearly very energetic, very interested in sort of running the observing bits. So I said, Simon, will you take over the Bath Astronomers bit? And we sort of agreed how that would happen, and he did. And um, he put his enormous energy into sort of running the, the, um, the stargazing business. Um, but it was hard work. Um, the energy was there, the interest was there, but what was hard to do was to get a group of people who are sufficiently focused on the observing bit of it as part of the Herschel uh, Society to have a group that would commit to observing, to running things, and so on. So um, 
uh, we agreed in about 2019, I think it was, that it made more sense to have a separate outfit called Bath Astronomers. And that was agreed you know, between Simon and me and, and the rest of the committee. Um, and that's what happened. So Bath Astronomers came, became a separate outfit um, and you know, has gone from strength to strength, as, as you will know, and you know, the, the evidence you're all being here um, is a dem demonstration of that. Meanwhile, lots happened in our own society. Um, since I've taken over, um, we started the Carolyn Herschel Prize Lectureship, which is now a great success. It's one of the things I'm most proud of, really, um, which is the only prize for aspiring female astronomers um, uh, in, in the country. And we've now had six, and it's now sort of known in the community, and, um, and I think much welcome. Um, we changed our name. We're now the Herschel Society. It's always been about all the Herschels, but it's now explicitly the Herschel Society. Um, we update, up, uh, updated our website, updated our, uh, our journals. And now we can pass around a copy of our journal to have a, a sense of what it looked like. Uh, we updated our logos as well. So just have a look and pass them back if you would. Um, and um, we got a more uh, broadly based um, uh, lecture program. Um, and we've also consciously expanded our scope. So COVID taught us all to use Zoom, uh, which we all had to for a period. What it meant for us is we could have members of our committee who were not based in Bath. So the current committee has two members um, based in the Western USA and one in Germany. And it's a very good way of having this international operation. So uh, while we are formally uh, constituted here in Bath, it's actually an international uh, organization, a membership likewise. Um, and uh, one of the things we did uh, in 2022 was to organize um, both a concert yeah. and um, a lecture, a lecture um, and a day of lectures on William Herschel uh, on the 200th anniversary of, of his death. And these were very successful, um, very popular here in, in Brilsey and Bath. Um, and um, you know, we had, for example, Jim Bennett's last talk, I think, you know, talking about you know, William's um, uh, techniques in, in, in making telescopes um, and Charles, and uh, Volker and Stein and Canola. So that, that went down very well. In 2000 and last year, we had a sort of looking at ourselves type year and you know, looked at how we were doing. And one concern we did have was uh, membership. Our membership had been up at 250 or so, it was going down. And we realized the generation who joined the society to actually you know, rescue the museum and form it was dying out well, briefly. Um, and the numbers are going down. And it also, you know, people were like me, you know, rather old, rather white, rather male. Fine, it's a number. You know, we want to balance, don't you? So we worked out what to do about that. And we did a whole, did a whole variety of things. Um, we, had, we did a survey as well to sort of make sure we understood who we were. Um, and, you know, we updated our website. We updated our, our PR material um, and, and did other things like that. But we also thought we'd go and ask elsewhere to see how other societies do the same thing. And I went to see the Flamsteed Society uh, in Greenwich, which is funny anyway, because it's a you know, fun thing they do. And um, they are rather interesting because, you know, here in Bath, we have Bath astronomers, the observing lot. We have us, the Herschel Society, and of course, the Bath Preservation Trust and Herschel Museum. Right. So three entities. Um, the BPT runs the museums, um, and that works very well now, by the way. That's how things changed over the past few years. Um, and it's now a very sort of organized arrangement. It used to be that our society ran the museum or tried to. Uh, Jonathan was involved over many years in that. And because you know, there wasn't the expertise in the society and the BBC wanted to help, it, it was all a bit hand to mouth. And it's now far more organized. Not easy, but it's organized. Um, the way it works with a Flamsey society is that you can join the Royal Museum of Greenwich and you pay to do that. And when you do pay to do that, you can also pay a bit more to join the Flamsey society. So it's actually a sub-list you know, uh, within the museum group. It's not a society by itself. And they have an observing group, which is done down, just, just done by WhatsApp. They also have a history group, which looks at history, because you know, Flamsteed was obviously the first one in the world, and they have as much interest in history as we do. And they organize history lectures. And I, I gave them one. Um, so, so and fun. what became clear from my talk with them is that the people who ran the history bit were actually ex-observers. They were they're brought in by coming to observing nights or observing days indeed. And that's what, um, and doing so in the society is, is what sort of teased their interest out in history. And that's a light bulb moment for me. Because while it's a good thing for, for astronomers to become a separate entity, so they become 
you know, our identity and, and, and all those things. What it had done also done was cut off the flow of recruits into our society. So that's why I'm here tonight, to try and explain to you why you as observers may be interested in, in joining the Herschel Society. Some of you already are, but let me just talk a bit about why. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to talk, tell you, I think, about Herschel. No, in terms of the history, I assume you know that William Herschel was a man who discovered the planet Uranus. Um, he's also, more importantly, the father of deep sky astronomy. Caroline Herschel, his sister, um, started off doing a whole variety of things, but became um, his assistant, discovered, made discoveries of her own, and became the first paid female astronomer. Um, Alexander, their sibling, was also a very important engineer. And Alexander is Simon's favorite, uh, Herschel, I think. Um, and John, uh, William's son, um, became the ultimate Victorian polymath. He did astronomy and music, uh, not, not music so much, maths, um, chemistry, photography, and so on. Um, so they're really quite a family. And what we do with them is a whole variety of things. One is obviously um, William and his, his observing um, and his observing records. What's happened fairly recently is the guy called Wolfgang Steinecker has come along and he's analyzed all of William's observations. And if you want to know about what William did with observing, the answer's in here. It costs you 50 quid or so from Amazon, but it's a fantastic book. It's the most thorough analysis ever done um, of William's um, observing. And it's a great thing to dip into. Um, from time to time, I wouldn't try and read it totally cover. But you, you, it's also a resource. So one interesting question is, um, William built great telescopes and he discovered Uranus. Why didn't he discover Neptune? Neptune was certainly in reach of his seven foot, let alone the other ones. And Wolfgang actually analyzed um, uh, William's observing, his, his sweeps, and, and I realized he never actually happened to look at the right part of the sky, the right part at the right time. So he's on with the question. Another question is why didn't William discover some of the minor planets? Because they'd also been in reach. And the answer is well, no one's done that one. So if you're, if you're curious about things, a project there for somebody to use. Now, Wolfgang, Wolfgang's information here to, want, to work out why William didn't discover the one of the planets. Uh, William's telescopes, the seven foot, there's a replica upstairs, um, there's the 40 foot model upstairs, of course, the important one was the 20 foot. And there's a nice picture of that on the side of the wall in the, um, in the shop. Um, one thing I did as part of the 2022 uh, celebration was to try and have some way of, of, of making that more visible, if you like. And so we started a project with a bunch of um, game students at Basketball University to develop a 3D uh, rep working model, if you like, a replica uh, in, 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 in virtual space of the 20 foot. And that's now on our website. And that was a lot of fun for me, a lot of fun for them too, actually. And it's good to have an engagement with the universities. Um, specular mirrors. Um, now the, the, the mirror upstairs in, in the replica is made of specular metal. Um, from time to time, we've thought about trying to, you know, to, to, to replicate that. And about eight years ago, an American called Brad Elder, an um, academic uh, in biology, oddly enough, um, came in and said, I've got these mirrors. And they are fantastic little, tiny, tiny specular mirrors, gleaming bright. So for, for, for a moment, for a, moment no, well, a few years, we had a project to try and get him to actually make new six inch specular mirrors. No, partly as, as improvements for the one upstairs, partly because uh, the rest Chinese companies who are trying to make replica telescopes. Um, sadly, the guy who's our contact for that, Michael Tabb, who's the person who made the telescope upstairs, died. So the relationship you know, also died with it. Um, but Brad's still out there. So if somebody wanted to pick up that and run with it, it's, it's another project that's sort of available. William's music in early life. Um, if you're interested in classical music at all, uh, William has lots of it and his family does too. And there are various concerts organized about that and some concerts done in terms of uh, references to him. Um, Caroline's story, of course. Um, she has a, has a fantastic example. If you want to sort of you know, fill a room, I give us a talk about Caroline Herschel. She's an inspiring person for our astronomers, for other women scientists, and for women generally. And there plays about her, books about her, um, an opera about her, and a dance, a dance thing about her as well. Um, so you know, th there's always things to be done there. Caroline's visitor books. Um, the um, the hardworking Wolfgang has actually analyzed her visitor, uh, the visitor books. And we knew about the king, the royalty, and so on. We knew about Haydn coming, for example. I didn't know that Byron came, Shelley came, and John Adams and John Quincy Adams, you know, before they were you know, two American presidents, also came. So it's quite a visitor list. Alexander, he's the awkward. 
uh, but Ingenie's engineer. No picture of him. So, you know, some work on him might be good. How about Jacob? Jacob, the older brother. He's the one who first came to, to England with, um, with William. He ended up dead, strangled in a field somewhere in Germany. What happened? Murder mystery there for somebody. Um, on to the next generation. This year, 2024, um, by a very happy co no, coincidence, we have um, a, a big conference coming up on John Herschel. I've always wanted to get into John Herschel more. He's a very unknown character. Um, and uh, the good news I, I discovered about a year ago was that Cambridge University Press are publishing a companion to John Herschel uh, with lots of components in it because he's a very difficult man to pin down. You know, maths, astronomy, uh, chemistry, photography, uh, philosophy, you name it. Um, and this is being published in April this year. And I contacted Professor Steve Case, who was the editor, I said, how about having a conference here in Bath about that? And he said, yes, fine. So he and I are now working to make that happen. It'll be at Brillsey uh, on June the 8th. The other thing happening is that um, the Royal Society are digitizing their own archive on John Herschel at about the same time. And they're having an academic conference the previous night, uh, day, sorry, in, in London. So, and, and the third thing's happening is that these, um, as part of the expansion of a museum here that Simon talked about, the museum needs to work out how to tell John Herschel's story. The museum has made an important decision, but it's not just about the Herschels in Bath. This is the only Herschel museum in the country, so it's about all the Herschels, so including the time in Slough, by, both by William and, and Caroline, but also by, 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 by John. So one thing they need to work out is how to tell John's story here, and there'll be a, a, a session um, for, at the museum for the current extent. That'll be very exciting. You know, it'll, it'll just be the start of a huge, I think, expansion of interest in, in, in John Herschel. You know, he, went, he went to South Africa, they had, tw they had 12 children, nine, nine daughters. No, what happened to all them? No, what, what are they achieve? Okay, uh, we have lots of other connections, obviously. We have connections to the Bath Preservation Trust here and Brillsy, uh, both universities here in Bath, uh, but also the RAS, William was the first president, and the Royal Society, as I mentioned, um, ESO, ESO, through all of our members. Um, and one's further afield now with Armagh University and, and also with the Spanish um, Royal Observatory because they've got a replica telescope that Herschel made, his favourite, the 25 foot. Um, these are all new friends you've made. Um, lots of walk-ins, you know, either here at the museum uh, or elsewhere. So lots of opportunities to pursue your interest in relation to what the Herschel did. Lots of fun. I think you can do it on cloudy nights. So just think about, think about joining us. Um, I mentioned Philosophy is one of the things that John Herschel did. This is a, um, a modern print of a book he published in 1830. It's the first book on the philosophy of science in English anyone ever wrote. And it's a good read. It's fascinating because it talks about the philosophy of science in a way I can understand, but also in relation to the science of the day, as understood at the dollar day. So it's really quite fascinating in terms of what was then known and not known. And here are some of our handouts. Please take one and pass them back. Any questions? Are you glad to take them? Uh, but it's thirteen pounds a year if you do digital, and eighteen pounds if you if you, like, if you want to have one of these um, uh, journals physically. Cheaper than past. Did I say that? Did That's I say off. That? Off you get. Off you get. Did off you get. Did I say that? God. Any other questions? Just to yeah. Just to reinforce what you said, Charles. I mean, I personally would highly recommend the lecture program. Um, at the RSI because um, obviously that's all a lot of that is modern topic, yeah. modern science. Yeah, it is. Um, so that that's it's not just looking back in history; it's actually current science as well. It is. Um, I mean, one thing, one particular thing about the Herschel Society um, and Bath is that it's a draw. They're both draws, and it's not too difficult to get really quite good people talking about their subject. Um, and it's a mixture between, between that um, and some history of uh, uh, science stuff too. So it's quite quite eclectic. But we have you know, quite quite a list of people. John doesn't like that. Any other questions? Yeah, Prim. Should uh, include the talks, the potential talks that they at the Brillsby. You're gonna you get a discount. Yeah. So basically, if you're a Brillsby member, you pay less, and yeah. you have the same discount if you if you're a member of our society. Uh, it doesn't work twice, I'm afraid. I'm a member of both. You don't get double discounts. <laughs> you don't. Know. That's a unique deal, by the way. Nobody else has that deal with Rosie. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.
Okay. Um, my knowledge of the alphabet suggests that Merrick is up next. Indeed. Here's the clicker. Top laser, up, down. Oh. Don't press the bottom one. Laser. Uh, okay. Cool. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Merrick. I'm going to talk about planetary atmospheres in 15 minutes. Now, that might be a lie because this <laughs> might take a bit longer. I may have to skip the last few panels. Simon, remember the microphone, please. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, so this will be a whistle stop tour of the solar system's atmospheres, um, including all the planets with the exception of Earth. Uh, although I will make some frequent Earth atmosphere comparisons to give you some perspective. Um, I do have some slides, um, but the slides are mainly reminders to you of which planet I'm going on about. Um, <laughs> you'll appreciate that joke more in about 10 minutes. Um, but I will sometimes interact with the slides as well, so just to make it more exciting. Right. Uh, Mercury, let's start with uh, our swift messenger planet. It's easy to assume that due to its tiny size, um, just 4,879 kilometres in diameter, and how close it is to the sun, just 60 million kilometres, that it wouldn't have an atmosphere at all. But surprisingly, it does, albeit a tenuous one. Uh, in a comparable way to how the moon has a tenuous atmosphere, molecules are gravitationally bound to Mercury enough to form an exosphere. Now, on Earth, an exosphere is the outermost layer of the atmosphere, the layer that sort of blends into space. So the composition of this uh, exosphere is 42% oxygen, 29% sodium, 22% hydrogen, and 6% helium, with some traces of potassium. Uh, now, although Mercury is smaller than Ganymede and Titan, it is more massive and denser than both, which helps it retain the little atmosphere it has but the combined pressure at the surface is 10 to the minus 14 bars, um, and one bar or 1,000 millibars is roughly surface pressure on Earth. Uh, the atmospheric content that it does have comes mainly from the solar wind in, for the hydrogen and the helium, and also from um, the other elements of crustal in origin. Sodium has been observed from analysis of Fraunhofer emissions mm -hmm. in 1985, and is believed to be mainly concentrated at the poles, and this diagram I will interact with this kind of it does have a weak magnetic field mercury um, partially due to a liquid outer core around a solid inner core, uh, I believe. Um, so this does deflect some of the solar wind and that may, may be why some of the um, sodium is picked up at the poles uh, and the interaction with the solar wind causes this almost cometary like tail to mercury uh, in which sodium has also been detected. There you go, Venus. Now, this is a proper atmosphere. It's a very thick atmosphere and very inhospitable one for most life on Earth. It consists mainly of carbon dioxide, 95.3%, nitrogen, 3.5%, and traces of sulfur dioxide. Now, 90% of the Venusian atmosphere is within 28 kilometers of the surface. To compare to Earth, 90% of Earth's atmosphere is within 16 kilometers of the surface. So it's a very thick, dense atmosphere. So let's talk about the surface. Temperatures are 467 Celsius. Famously, the surface of Venus is hotter than any other planet in the solar system, hot enough to melt lead. Uh, the pressure is 93 bars, which is roughly the same as at 900 meters under the ocean on Earth. The carbon dioxide at the surface is actually a supercritical fluid at those pressures, so it acts somewhat like a gas and somewhat like a fluid, potentially even shaping the surface topography but that's just speculation. The Venusian clouds consist of sulfuric acid. This is produced in the upper atmosphere by the sun's photochemical action on carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and water vapor. The sulfur is thought to have come from early volcanic activity um, with elevated temperatures preventing it from becoming trapped in other compounds like it is on Earth. 
and the sulfuric rain that falls from these clouds um, actually never reaches the ground. It evaporates before it can get there. So it's very similar to a, an effect that we'll see on Earth, which we call verdure, which is when clouds will rain, but it will not reach the ground. It will evaporate back up before it hits the ground, which you've probably all seen. Same effect. Super rotation exists in the upper atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere of Venus circles the planet in just four days. Uh, winds up here are in excess of 100 meters per second, way faster than on Earth. And this is to do with many things, but mainly because the heating of the day side of Venus creates a massive pressure difference to the colder dark side. And that drives most of the, the winds and, and the weather. Interestingly, though, it is noted that despite this apparent hostility, there is a zone 50 kilometers to 65 kilometers above the surface where atmospheric pressure and temperature are nearly the same as Earth, making this region uh, on Venus the most Earth-like area in the solar system that's not on Earth that we've found so far. So dirigibles, colonies, all possible. <laughs> is there life on Venus? Um, there was considerable discussion about the detection of phosphine in 2020, uh, as this is a potential biomarker for life. But some checks were made. They went back through old um, data and rechecked stuff. And the, um, there does not appear to be as much as was originally claimed. Now, phosphine can be formed through chemical reactions between sulfuric acid and certain minerals in the atmosphere. But there are also biological processes that cause it as well, which is why this is an interesting thing to find. Some microbes on Earth produce phosphine as a metabolic byproduct. Mars. Popular satellite and rover holiday spot, mm. Mars, has a very thin atmosphere. Um, and like Venus, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide, 95.3%, with some nitrogen and argon and trace elements of water, oxygen, carbon monoxide and noble gases. The surface pressure is about 6.1 millibars. And again, Earth surface being about 1,013 millibars. And the average surface temperature is minus 63 degrees Celsius, but highs reach 20 degrees Celsius in equatorial regions, if you're thinking of a holiday. Uh, the, the thin atmosphere and the low temperatures prevent liquid water from uh, uh, on the surface. It remains in a gaseous state. And despite the majority carbon dioxide atmosphere, it doesn't have the kind of intense greenhouse effect that Venus has due to the thinness of the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide also forms as ice in the polar regions where it reaches down to about minus 78 Celsius. And the freezing and the release of this carbon dioxide annually by evaporation and sublimation causes quite large variations in atmospheric pressure over the Martian year. Uh, the composition of the atmosphere is from crustal sources and through photolysis of carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere. Mars is famous for its dust storms. Now, dust storms can occur on Mars. Local ones, they're categorized uh, into three types. Local ones uh, that are around 10 to the three kilometers squared, so about the size of LA. Uh, regional ones, 10 to the six kilometers squared, about the size of uh, Egypt. And global ones, uh, 10 to the eight kilometers squared, which is about the size of Africa. Um, and they happen with uh, the the smaller ones happen more frequently than the larger ones, obviously. Um, at June 2018, a dust storm that became the most extensive ever recorded, spanning an area the size of North America and Russia combined, led to the demise of Opportunity Rover and its mission. Uh, dust Devils. And you can see this is a great picture, uh, a great video from the Curiosity Rover of a dust devil on Mars. Um, so these are formed exactly the same way that they're formed on Earth, um, with convective forces driven by strong surface heating loaded with dust particles. Now, these tend to have a diameter of tens of meters, tens of meters across and heights much larger than that of Earth, several kilometers in some cases, probably due to the thinness of uh, the lack of a changing atmosphere with vertical height. Like with Venus, there was a there must be life moment on when methane was discovered in the atmosphere of Mars. Now, methane is chemically unstable in the current oxidizing atmosphere of Mars. It would quickly break down due to ultraviolet light from the sun and chemical reactions with other gases. Um, and there's no obvious source for methane because there's not any tectonic activity there anymore. So uh, where's it coming from? So evidence of methane would suggest there's a repeating process creating it. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't last uh, very long. 
But uh, similar to the thing with the phosphine on Venus, the ESA Roscosmos Trace Gas Orbiter found no traces of methane, but detections have been made from ground-based telescopes and from Curiosity. Um, there are many ways that this can be generated abiotically, but biological processes cannot be discounted. Jupiter. Okay, this is the largest planetary atmosphere in the solar system. Um, now, all of these outer planets have a theme. Um, so Jupiter is 75% hydrogen and 24% helium, which is pretty much the same proportions as in the sun. Um, there are lesser amounts of methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide and water. Uh, the atmosphere, unlike the other planets I've already spoken about, has no clear boundary at its base and it gradually transitions into a liquid interior. The upper clouds visible on the surface are organised into a dozen or so zonal bands parallel to the equator. This is a really good video because it shows all of those. Um, these are bounded by zonal uh, atmospheric flows of winds known as jets. The bands alternate in colour, so the dark bands are called belts, the light ones are called zones. The zone's lighter colour is thought to be from ammonia rice, but what gives the darker bands their colour is currently unknown. Um, and even the origin of these bands is still not well understood. The bands and zones are driven by strong jets that work along the boundaries between them in opposite directions. So you can see that quite clearly on that image there. Powerful storms and lightning are connected to the evaporation and condensation of water. Strong vertical upwelling forms bright and dense clouds. And these can be water clouds. And when they form, they create lightning many hundreds of times more powerful than those on Earth. And the water uh, is thought mostly to come from impacting comets like Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 1994. The colourful nature of Jupiter um, is thought to come from the presence of sulphur, phosphorus and carbon. Jupiter actually radiates more heat than it receives from the sun, about a billionth of the total power radiated by the sun. There's not much difference in tropospheric temperature between the poles and the equator, but one theory suggests the reason for that is that its convective interior acts like a thermostat, releasing more energy at the poles than at the equatorial regions, whereas in Earth, uh, the heat in the atmosphere transfers from the equators to the poles fairly consistently. So the Great Red Spot um, is the major atmospheric feature on Mars. Uh, it's an anticyclonic storm, 22 degrees south of the equator, which has been around for at least 350 years, or essentially for as long as we've been looking at Jupiter. Um, so we don't know how long it was there before that. Um, now, uh, fifth, half a century ago, it was 40,000 kilometres east to west, which is several Earth's diameter across. Um, currently, it's only about 16,350 kilometres across, so it's fluctuating, but we don't know whether that's going to mean it will shrink and disappear, or whether that's just part of a longer term fluctuation. We don't know yet. <clears throat> so winds at the edge of the uh, Great Red Spot are strong, about 120 metres per second. Um, that's 432 kilometres an hour. So a hurricane, the strongest hurricane on Earth, would be less than that, about 320 kilometres an hour. But inside the Red Spot, it's quite stagnant with little inflow or outflow. And inside, it's is warmer than the outside. There's another feature called the Oval BA, which is just shown there uh, on the other side of Jupiter. Now, um, this was first seen in 2000 after a collision of three small white storms and has intensified ever since. It's sometimes, it's, the official name is Oval BA. I couldn't figure out what BA stood for, um, but it's often called the Red Spot Junior, the Red Junior, or the Little Red Spot. <laughs> Possibility of life on Jupiter. Um, so there is phosphine and methane in the atmosphere, but at levels that are explainable by abiotic normal processes. However, there were discussions that since there was lightning uh, and all the ingredients of the famous Miller-Urey experiment of 1953, where it was proved that the combination of lightning and compounds existing in the early Earth's atmosphere can form organic matter, that similar conditions could potentially exist on Jupiter. But the jury is still out on that one. How am I doing for time? No, it's two more minutes. Okay, cool. So we're going to move to Saturn. I might have to skip Uranus and Neptune, but um, 
<laughs> That's sacrilege here, isn't it? Similar, I should have just done the whole thing on Uranus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, similar in composition to Jupiter. And this is a theme with all of these outer planets, it's hydrogen and helium. If anyone asks you what they're made of, that's always a good guess. Um, the proportions are slightly different though. Saturn has much more hydrogen than he uh, helium, sorry, hydrogen than Jupiter. It has 96% hydrogen and 3% helium with traces of methane and other hydrocarbons. And again, similar to Jupiter, ammonia crystals exist in the upper clouds and the lower clouds are of ammonium hydrosulfide and then water ice. Uh, it has a banded cloud system. Um, I didn't put a picture of Jupiter or uh, Saturn up here because there's not much you can see um, from those pictures on the surface like you can with Jupiter. Um, in fact, when I was doing the research for this, it was referred to as an otherwise bland atmosphere, which I think is really mean. Um, <laughs> but thank God it has rings. Um, but it does exhibit long-lived ovals and other features uh, common also on Jupiter. So I'm going to skip and do a little bit on Uranus and Neptune then. Um, uh, oh, this is cool. This is the north um, pole uh, of Saturn. It's got this hexagonal thing. Uh, there was something cool about this that I wanted to talk about. Um, right, yeah, so this is, the sides of this are 14 and a half thousand kilometers long and the entire structure rotates with a period of 10 hours, 39 minutes and 24 seconds, which is incredibly precise, whoever worked that out. But this is apparently also the same as the period of the planet's radio emissions and assumed to be equal to the period of rotation of the planet's interior. And that whole paragraph for me deserves more investigation. Um, but they have recreated this in laboratory conditions. So it, it is possible to have that. It's not aliens. <laughs> so, um, I've got some, you can see, this is, might almost be what Saturn would look like without its rings, in a way. Um, these outer planets don't have as much of dynamic atmospheres visually as Jupiter. Um, and again, they're mostly made of hydrogen and helium. Um, Uranus has some, um, has much more methane in it, but only 2%. But um, I think that's the reason why, um, because methane is... Uh, yeah, it was discovered from ground-based uh, spectroscopic observations, and it has prominent absorption bands in the infrared and near-infrared, which gives it the aqu aquamarine or cyan colour that you've got there. Uh, and Uranus's uh, tilted um, situation doesn't really affect the weather. This still goes round um, either in a retrograde or prograde motion with the orbit, with the spin of Uranus. It, it's not affected by the heat. Uh, Neptune is a little bit more exciting, and I remember picking up uh, a copy of Astronomy Now magazine in 1989 when it had these pictures on it, and there was relief that it wasn't as boring as <laughs> Uranus looked from an atmospheric point of view, and I always thought that was quite mean as well, <laughs> but um, it does have some features, so, um, and again, uh, hydrogen 80%, helium 19%, so there's a theme about these outer planets, uh, with trace amounts of methane, uh, which also gives it that bluish colour. Um, so, and these clouds that have been observed, these are right at the top because you can see the shadows that they cast on the, the, the mo majority atmosphere below them. And these things come and go. The only main feature on Jupiter, oh, sorry, on Neptune that um, you'll all have heard about is the great dark spot uh, discovered in 1989 by Voyager 2. And that's about 13,000 kilometers wide. Um, so I'll call it a day at that, I think. Thank you. So Merrick, in terms of weather forecasting, which is the easiest planet to mm -hmm. forecast? Um, to forecast? Yeah. Out of all of those, probably Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Today there'll be nothing, and <laughs> tomorrow there'll yeah. be nothing. <laughs> yes. It'll be hot. Scorchio. That'll be the forecast for Mercury. Any other questions for Merrick? I heard a little while ago that the, because we always think of Neptune being sort of a darker blue colour than Uranus, mm. but I did hear that actually that was something that was falsified or by yeah, NASA, yeah, that uh, the, there have been new pictures published which yeah. give a truer colour to our eyes of what it would look like, and it's a lot paler than that. 
Does the fact that value that the composition of the atmosphere is almost identical then the two planets as well? Uh, they are very identical anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know why the images came out like that when they did. But um, they couldn't bear it for so long. Yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> they wanted something to report. They up the saturation. Yeah. yeah, they had the processing software, so whoop, <laughs> take it all the way to the right. Yeah, it also might be easier to identify features like these would be harder to see if it was in the true color. The Maybe it wouldn't look as good on the front page. Yeah. <laughs> Do the ring systems have any support software? That's a good question, and one that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> but I, I'm right away thinking, does our moon have an influence on our weather? Because yeah. it would be in similar territory. But I'll, I'll find out. Um, one of the things I've always learned doing outreach with both astronomers is, is when you get a question that you can't answer, you go home and you find the, the answer. Uh, and, and in the hope that you can answer the person who asked it, and also the next time somebody asks that question, you will know the answer. And I'll get him to write a letter for the newsletter, an article for the newsletter about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mary. All right. Next up is Paul. So we'll do a mic swap. That'd be good. Yep. So the top one is laser. Yeah. That's up and down. Don't press the bottom one. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name's Paul. Um you probably most of you don't know me because I don't know most of you. Um I've been a member for just over a year, I think. Uh, and I've sort of come to some of these meetings. I haven't been to any of the observing sessions, so I haven't really got to know anybody very much, but I'm on the WhatsApp. Um, but this is probably a bit of light relief. Really. This, is more, this is more in the way of an anecdote with pictures. Um, it's a, a bit of my life story, really. Um, I, I, I'll just start by saying that I, I, I've only been in, in the Bath area for just over a year. Um, we moved down from Manchester, uh, where I've been a GP for 33 years. Um, and I've always been interested in astronomy. Um, since again, since about the age of 10, got my first telescope when I was 10. Um, it went into abeyance in the middle when I had a when I had a job that involved being up at night a lot. <laughs> you didn't really want to be being up at night a lot when you were off duty. So but we did what happened to me was after I trained as a GP and got to a stage where I was I'd done all my qualifications so I could walk into a GP practice. I, at that stage I wanted to go and work overseas for a while. So my wife and I ended up in Northwest Pakistan, as you do. Um, now, one of the features of being in Northwest Pakistan was that there was very little light pollution. We had an extra 20 degrees of sky. It was 32 degrees north latitude. Um, and I just couldn't live there without some optical aid. I took a pair of binoculars with me. But um, so, so this story is about getting a telescope out to the Northwest frontier province, as it was then. Of, of Pakistan, and that's all it's about. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are, that, that's Pakistan. Um, this is the pretty bit at the top, which is all about Himalayas and Hindu Kush and all exciting mountains like that. This is the deserty plain bit at the top, uh, at the bottom, where it gets roughly to the temperature of the surface of Venus. Mm -hmm. um, well, 50, 50 degrees centigrade we saw regularly in the summer, which is uh, quite hard to bear. We were in this place, which looks like tank, but it's pronounced Tank. Uh, that's not quite right. Tank without the aspiration. Um, the nearest town was Dera Ismail Khan, which people, some people, well, people who come from Pakistan know Dera Ismail Khan. Nobody knows Tank. Um, it's a little city of about 60,000 people in those days. I think it's grown a bit since then. And you'll notice that it's got mountains to the west of it and then the desert to the east of it. And that was about the story, really, of Tank, right on the what is what was in those days called Northwest Frontier Province is now known as something almost unpronounceable called Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Um, but I won't say that, otherwise you might get wet. Um, right, this is the kind of terrain of the deserty bit. 
um, and somebody with a sense of humour put London <laughs> on the bottom of the, uh, <laughs> the, the signpost there. Um, the, the mountains are very dry, very arid, um, and they, that direction basically is Afghanistan. We were about 60 miles from the Afghan border. And the reason we were there partly was because there was a huge influx of Afghan refugees and we were working amongst, partly amongst the Afghan refugees because the Russians were in Afghanistan at the time, if you remember. I haven't told you when it was. It was in the 1980s. Um, oh, sorry. That is right. This is the, uh, the town of Park from the outside, just looking in. Um, uh, combination of sort of mud houses and brick houses, um, very hot in the summer. And this is what uh, it looked like in the main street. And I've been on the internet and had a look down the main street uh, co in contemporary, uh, contemporary wise on YouTube and so on. It really hasn't changed much. Mm -hmm. um, socially, it hasn't changed at all. There are still no women visible in the main street. Um, those who do, uh, go out shopping or whatever, would go in a horse-drawn panga. Um, if you saw a woman in the street, she would be completely covered in, in the burqa. Um, very, very conservative Islamic society um, with all the particular customs and so on which, which go along with that. Um, very, very interesting, absolutely fascinating place for a, for a Brit to work, particularly because we've got a lot of history out there um, for, for good or ill. And that was the other extreme. That was about 40 miles down east of us. That's the River Indus, which is 14 miles wide at that point. It's just sort of braiding. It's not all water. Um, and that varies a lot. In those days, there was when we first went there, there was no bridge. Um, and we used to drive over to get to Lahore. We used to drive over this uh, pontoon bridge uh, over these various sections of the, of the river. There is now a, a spanking new, well, it was spanking new, um, a very nice concrete bridge but that was a bit more exciting really mm -hmm. um, the other extreme that is the pretty northern area or the majestic northern areas that's the the sort of hindu kush um what's the karakoram area of the himalaya um that's one of the glaciers up there which we went to see um, and that was the mission hospital where we found ourselves um been there for about well it started as a small dispensary in the 19th century and um so been there for over 100 years and um, about 100 beds in the hospital and uh, a busy place. Again, all men uh, and, and they would bring their women in um, when things were arranged, when they got their chit and all that. Um, and that was my job. There's me about 55 years younger. Um, <laughs> that was my day job. And then when I, when I, when I went home, <laughs> For the first, I, I was, we were allowed to go home every year for a few weeks in the hot summer. And um, I'd had something to do with this firm, full of scopes. I'd, I'd bought various uh, eyepieces and things. This was when they were in Finchley Road. Um, <laughs> that is Dudley Fuller, yes, I, that's a picture from the internet. Um, don't know whether some of you might remember Dudley Fuller, real character. Um, he started up this telescope business. Telescope businesses were, were rare as hen's teeth in those days. You know, people didn't make telescopes. There weren't, there weren't sort of commercially made things available at the, at the click of a mouse button. So you wouldn't have known what a mouse button was, obviously. Um, so there's Dudley Fuller in his shop. Well, what happened with me was when I went home, I decided that I was going to take a telescope back with me. I couldn't obviously take a massive telescope, so I was going to take the optics back with me after my first visit home. And I was there for another four years. Um, so it was worth doing that. So from Dudley Fuller, who by that stage was in Farringdon Road, not, not in Finchley Road, that's an older picture, Broadhurst, Clarkson and Fuller as then it came, it came to be in Farringdon Road. So I went along Farringdon Road with my dad um, and I had to persuade him to keep quiet because Dudley Fuller was so slow at serving. He was, my dad was going like this. Um, but he was quite a character, this Dudley Fuller. So I bought an eight inch mirror um, parabolic reflector mirror. I bought a spider on a flat and I took the eyepieces from one of my other telescopes um, and these things I got all packed up and I took out on the plane um, for Manic's tour of duty in Pakistan. This is, that's where Leo Hustler comes in. Leo Hustler was from Finland. He was one of our colleagues. He was an engineer 
very useful chat to have around when you want to build a telescope <laughs> or put together a telescope. Um, so he was the one who did all the, or, or who supervised all the uh, donkey work about um, putting the mount up on the bungalow roof and all that kind of stuff. And then this guy, this this guy was an absolute star. He he is the hospital was the hospital carpenter, Habibullah Khan. He had never seen anything like this in his life before. Obviously, he thought he was building a coffin, <laughs> um, but actually he was building this very simple square tube to house the 8-inch mirror. Um, he did a fantastic job. And of course, um, once it was all put together, we had all the workers who'd been involved in doing it um, to up on the roof to have a look at the, the sky, which was, which was quite an experience. So Habibullah Khan did the woodwork. And that was what our garden looked like. The hospital had a very big compound, uh, which had been irrigated over a number of years and had become quite a nice garden. Um, the problem was getting out of the influence of all these wretched tall trees, eu eucalyptus trees and palm trees and things. Um, so we went up on a bungalow roof some, some, somewhat like this, um, where we could at least get a, a fairly decent view of the sky. And that was what I ended up with. A closed fork equatorial mount, um, which you would never see nowadays. Um, the great disadvantage of it is, of course, you can't look at anything that's near the pole star. Um, but who wants to look at something that's near the pole star when you're actually all, all you're interested in is the extra 20 degrees of southern sky, really? Um, so that was what it ended up looking like. Um, you can imagine that polar alignment was only done once. Um, <laughs> We, we squinted up through this pipe here and squinted up through that pipe here <laughs> and aligned it with the pole star and put bricks in the right place and, and then the concrete set and that was it. There was no more adjustment. <laughs> um, but it was good enough for jazz or good enough for visual astronomy. Um, and what did we have? Well, that is what that is the great draw of doing something like that in a place like Pakistan. Not only the dark skies, but you've got that extra 20 degrees of sky um, and, and you've got the, the tail of Scorpio, um, the galactic center, which everybody calls the galactic core nowadays, don't know what, um, and Sagittarius and Corona Australis and things like that. That's a bit of a loop or something, it looks like a wolf. Um, so that, that was very exciting. And it, when I look at my old Norton Star Atlas, it's got lots of little ticks in that area of sky. Mm -hmm. all, it was in the days when they, used, they had the Herschel catalogue numbers of all these things. So they're H1 so-and-so and H6 so-and-so. And you have to kind of convert these into NGC numbers. And so I spent my time basically trying to tick off all these things in that 20 degrees of sky through the year, which was really fantastic. I mean, it, for me, it was just a dream um, and lovely skies. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a bonus. We could actually see Canopus. Um, we couldn't quite see Akanar in Eridan, the bright star, the first magnitude star in Eridan. So that was, I think theoretically we might have seen it, but I couldn't get the horizon to, to see that. But Canopus was, you could pick it up just when it was uh, at its highest in the south. But look how high Orion is, you know, right up here. And Syria, you know, Sirius, and you've got the Milky Way there, and the, the whole of Canis Major is very well visible. So it was very exciting. And that is um, the early morning sky in March 1986, and that is the position of Halley's Comet. Um, and we, I was there in 1986, and we actually had quite good views of Halley's Comet um, after perihelion uh, when it when it was at its well, it, it was magnitude 1.92 then, which is, I mean, it wasn't amazing. Uh, we, were, we, we have been very unlucky with Halley's, Halley's mm -hmm. Comet. We were the people who got the worst um, apparition of Halley's Comet. It wasn't, it was a long way from the Earth. It wasn't very bright. Uh, Neowise in 2020 was much better. Um, but it was nice to see Halley's Comet properly. Um, that, is the, that is the only picture of the sky I've got not taken through, obviously through the eight inch uh, reflector, but taken with the camera strapped on to the eight inch reflector with some string or something mm -hmm. and manually driven. I think it's about a 10 minute exposure, probably 400 ASA film, um, terrible star shapes, but that's Orion from Pakistan. Um, and you can see there's quite a lot of stars visible there. 
um, the picture I took with my camera, digital camera on a tripod, just for, for 20 seconds on Monday night in Hemington was much better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's digital photography for you. Just one more story before I dry up. Um, the guy on the extreme left there is a guy called um, Haji Asanullah. Um, we got to know him when he came into hospital with cerebral malaria. He was very ill, he nearly died. But it was a huge business when he came into hospital, very, very sick, because he was a local Hakim, a, um, a, traditional, doc a traditional doctor. So he was a guy who was famous in the area. He saw a lot of patients. He referred patients to us. So when he got ill, everybody, everybody and his wife came with him, you know. Um, or they all wanted to have uh, updates on his condition every half an hour and so on. But the other thing, he, he got better, fortunately, um, and he became a really great friend. Um, now, Haji had two or three different enthusiasms. One was hunting, one was shooting stuff to eat, which was fine. Uh, the other was trapping birds um, like this, dem demoiselle cranes. People love having, rich people love having captive birds in their gardens. So he would go out and he would take uh, some cranes in cages out into the desert, camp there overnight and use the calls of the cranes. They, they take the cages one apart from another. So they started calling to each other. And then the cranes who were migrating, who, who heard the, the voices of the cranes on the ground would come down and they'd capture them, clip the wings and sell them to people to have in their gardens. All very nice. What's that got to do with astronomy? Well, of course, when he offered me the chance to go out into the desert for a night and camp when to, to witness this crane hunt, I thought, aha, we must arrange this at New Moon um, because it'll be away from any light pollution. And um, unfortunately, I haven't got any pictures, but this is not my picture, but this is the kind of sky that, we, that I experienced with a night out in the desert in Pakistan. Obviously, the ecliptic is, more, is, at a, is at a steeper angle to the horizon down there. Um, the zodiacal light was just, you know, I, I've never seen it. Zodiacal light, I believe, where people call it nowadays, but I've all my life called it zodiacal light. Um, it was so obvious, you know, it, it just screamed at you. You couldn't possibly miss it. What is that glow that's arising from the horizon? Is it aliens or something, you know? Um, so I, I sort of never thought I would see that for myself. Probably some of you have seen it on foreign holidays and so on. But, you know, the Milky Way and the zodiacal light. We even saw something, if you turned your back, we even saw something in the, on the opposite side of the sky from the sun called the Gegenschein, which means opposite shot. Gegen in German is opposite. Um, so the, 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 the sort of um, concentration of the, of the solar eclipse plane dust causing the reflection um, of the sun or the reflection of the sun, the solar dust opposite the sun. So that was quite an experience, um, another one that we, we had when we were out there. Um, this, this talk ends sadly because um, one thing I couldn't do, really, because we had so much stuff to bring home, was to bring home these objects. So I thought, well, what, what do I do with this telescope? Nobody's going to use it. Ah, I thought there's a school, there was an international school near to Islamabad, which I knew some of the teachers and everything. There was a physics teacher who I thought would take an interest. So I wrote reams and reams of stuff. I, he, would have, he would have had to make a mount for it, but we'd done that. We, Leo could help him. Um, I wrote reams and reams of stuff as to what to do, as to how to use this telescope. And then a, few, a couple of years later, I, I, I gave this telescope to the school in my great generosity. Um, it, was, it was easier than bringing it home. A couple of years later, I saw Leo again, and he told me the last he saw of this telescope, it was in a metal box on the roof full of water um, because it had, been, it had been in a wetter area of Pakistan. And it, it had just, they, they just neglected it. The moral of that story, I think, is never give something away. <laughs> Charge them, make them pay for it, and they will value it. But if, if you give it away, you know, nobody owns it, nobody values it. It's, it's, it was my enthusiasm, it wasn't that physics master's enthusiasm, so maybe it was a, a, a thing which, which could never work. So anyway, Planck, 18-inch Newtonian reflector, RIP, um, but it was a great thing while it lasted.
So thanks for having me. Thanks, Dr. Maybe not the sort of chat that needs questions, but if anybody has any questions, yes. Do you have any problems from official firm or trust firm? Uh, yes, I say, I say I took the optics out. Actually, I had already gone back. My wife brought the optics out. <laughs> you, you have a, an optics mule, though. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. Um, I, I think somebody did. Somebody did look at it, yeah. and she explained, and I think they just about believed it. Yeah. We were, we, it, it was the, it was the Afghan-Russian war. Yeah. The Americans were supplying arms to the Afghans right past our hospital. It was a pretty sensitive area, yeah. actually. But we were fortunate; we had some fairly powerful political people living next door to the hospital, right. who we immediately invited in to have a look at the stars. You know. Yeah. Um, so that so that they would be on side. So that that was that was quite good. Actually, what one of the I meant to say one of the interesting things to, about all your think about all your outreach things for, with Bath astronomers. Um, you know, I I did my own bits of outreach with the hospital staff and the various local dignitaries and so on. Very interesting trying to explain astronomy to people who, <laughs> you know, have a you know, they're, they're very they're very intelligent. In, intellectual people in their own spheres but they haven't really had an exposure to right. to that that sort of science um and i was trying to do it in urdu um which is you know how do you how do you describe a galaxy in urdu to somebody who's never seen I mean, doesn't really know what a star is <laughs> it's a very interesting process but uh, challenging yeah. okay thank you okay thank you all right so we'll swap you for steve Get Steve all mic'd up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's laser and then just up down slides on that one. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm Steve, and I'm going to talk to you about quasars seen from my back garden, which is about one mile from the centre of Bath. Um, it will be the least photogenic astrophotography talk you've ever seen. We're only going to be looking at bright dots, again, compared with other bright dots. But I hope to still get across uh, some sort of sense of wonder about looking at these particular bright dots. So we'll start with this one, 3C273. Uh, the third Cambridge Catalogue of Radio Sources Entry number 273. It's the first quasar identified as such uh, and named as such uh, in the early 60s. It had a peculiar radio signature. It was, uh, and um, it was quite a bright object. It's, uh, this is probably the only quasar I'll show tonight which you probably easily see in your back garden. And I say easily, if your eyes are dark adapted and your sky is not really city centre, you could probably see this one through an eight inch or, or a 10 inch reflector. When I say see that, you should have a good star map as well because it just does look like all the other stars which are next to it. So you need a good star map to identify that particular one as a quasar. But when professional observers looked at that in the early 1960s, they were a bit shocked to see that it had a, a, an optical redshift, which was indicating that it was a long way away. Nowadays, we'd say it was about two and a half billion light years away. Now, for its brightness, that, that shocked them a bit at the time because if you placed our galaxy or the Andromeda galaxy, any decent galaxy, we know of in this area at that distance uh, that spot would be about 50 to 100 times brighter than the whole galaxy um, on top of that they were able to get a rough idea of how big it was from the fluctuations in the light that put a sort of limit on how large it was they knew it wasn't galaxy size the first estimate said it was probably about 15 light years across and, and subsequently that came down quite rapidly to less than a light year so they had this dilemma at the time there's this one light year or less object which is shining many, many times brighter than good-sized galaxies. Because, and at the time, it provoked a lot of um, confusion for professionals because they thought uh, 
maybe the redshift doesn't mean it's that at that distance. There's some other reason for redshift, but that's that's a whole history of its own right. In the end, we now know that these things really are a long way away, and these small objects are shining brighter than good science galaxies. We just click on that screen. We had a good talk last month about supermassive black holes, and that was a whole core of what a, a quasar is about. We we were told that uh, most big galaxies have supermassive black holes at, at their centre. They themselves are not bright, but their gravitational field attracts uh, gas and dust in a swirling manner around them, a bit like water going down the drain hole, which is moving so fast, it almost speeds approaching the speed of light sometimes, that it generates a lot of frictional heat and energy and light. And it's those things, these accretion disks, which are the bright objects, which are really the quasars. And they were a lot more common in the earlier stages of the universe, some billions of years ago when there's a lot more gas and dust floating around these uh, supermassive black holes at the centre of galaxies. Uh, we don't seem to have that quite so much in our vicinity, so we don't have any particularly nearby quasars. Um, so we now understand what quasars are. And so I've been hunting, oops. I've been hunting for other quasars in my back garden, which are maybe a bit more interesting than just one bright dot. Now this is one you can see quite easily, a twin quasar. If you look very carefully now, I'll, I'll zoom in on that in a minute. Can you see two little dots close to each other? Um, that's quite close to the plough. Um, when that was discovered back in um, 1979, the uh, optical observer, uh, observer saw redshifts on those two dots were very were identical. Um, the spectra were almost identical. Uh, and the brightnesses were almost identical, and then right next door to each other. Statistically, that was very unlikely. So it quickly dawned on them this could be the first example they'd seen of a prediction that Einstein had made of gravitational masses being able to split life sources further behind them. And subsequently, they did find that there was a galaxy. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So there's a zoom in on my twin quasar, which is a, it's a four-inch telescope in a back garden one, one mile from Bath, and uh, it's, it's quite easy to resolve those two components. Uh, but Hubble does it a bit better than I do, <laughs> and that's the Hubble image. Um, and the Hubble one does show a slight blur there with a slight dot next to it, which is the intermediate galaxy. So the, this twin quasar, or the, the quasar that's been split into two components, is about eight billion light years away. Remember, that's twice the age of the Earth, that light's been travelling to reach us. Uh, and there's a galaxy about 4 billion light years away, which has split the light into two components. Longer term observations have shown that uh, the light fluctuation in one over a long period of time, over about a year, is matched a year later by the other one. So uh, there's a light path difference of about a year, but when you consider that they're 8 billion light years away, that's not much of a, a difference, but there is a small light difference. So that's a bit more interesting, you're seeing that from your back garden, and realising the light's taken 8 billion years to reach you. Another one, which I, uh, I've, I've been researching these before I go look at them. Big star field, yet another star, which doesn't look particularly exceptional. It's called the Andromeda Quasar, uh, Andromeda Parachute Quasar. I'll explain in a second. Discovered in 1996, 11 billion light years away. So remember the universe is 13.7.8 billion years. So that's been traveling most of the duration of the universe to reach my little back garden in Bath. Um, <laughs> And this is what the professionals see. It is another gravitationally split one, four components, with a galaxy just about visible in the middle there. Maybe a lower resolution one, just shows an extended blob, starlight blob. I'm afraid my zoomed in version of the previous image just shows a blob. I can't see the uh, gravitational split, there's no chance I can see that. We're talking about three arc seconds across there, so uh, it'd be very, very hard to see that with an amateur telescope. But nonetheless, 11 billion light years away, I was getting quite interested that I was seeing objects that far away. Another one I went looking for, I had to use a finder chart to exactly track it down, the two little blurry galaxies there, and then I finally identified that on the finder chart. 8 billion light years away, another lens galaxy, but you needed good radio interferometry to break it up into its various components with the central galaxy there. So I've, I've got no chance of seeing the gravitational splitting, but um, again, uh, it's a uh, it's quite an interesting object to be able to see in your back garden. I'm going to go through two or three others very quickly, just boring ones. Um, 
there are 17 quasars greater than magnitude 15, so they're conceivably within the reach of an amateur telescope. Maybe not optically, unless you've got one of those giant 18 inch ones in a dark sky site. But uh, there's 17 identified greater than magnitude 15, 150 greater than magnitude 16, so that's still within easy camera range. And it goes up dramatically exponentially after that. I think they've now identified in star catalog something between one and three million quasars uh, photometrically from survey telescopes. So there's a lot out there, but all above about magnitude 23. So another one, 10.9 billion light years away in another case. Again, they don't look dramatic, but you're just sort of feeling sensible that you've had most of the age of the universe for that light to arrive in your back garden and for you to be able to identify an image. I can't say that's quasar, but using professional resources and star maps, you can uh, you can find that. Another one, 10.8 billion light years away in Virgo. This one here. Um, this is my record holder, my last slide. Uh, 12.5 billion years, uh, light years away. So the universe was only 1.3, 1.4 billion years old when the light from that object set off to arrive in my back garden in Bath. Um, it's attracted quite a bit of attention, this one in professional journals that I've looked up online, because it's quite bright for its distance. And they've pretty much decided that all of these fairly bright ones that an amateur could see at those sort of distances are probably gravitationally lensed, just to give them an extra boost in their brightness. Uh, including the ones I've shown before. They haven't always been able to demonstrate it because it's quite hard to find, but this one I believe they've now resolved as is gravitationally lens, which explains why it's relatively bright, 16.5, which is towards the limit of what I can see in my telescope anyway. So um, I suppose the final thing to leave with the sort of sense of war is not only is that those photons have been travelling so long to reach me, those sort of magnitudes around magnitude 16, you can actually work out how many photons are arriving in your telescope. It's not a hard <laughs> calculation to do it back in. If, if somebody tells you that the star Vega has got so many watts per square uh, meter, you can then extrapolate down to magnitude 16 and work out basically how many photons are arriving in your little four inch telescope. And I'm getting about 350 photons a second arriving from that particular <laughs> galaxy. But I still think it's pretty awesome that you're getting 350 <laughs> photons a second arriving in your garden in Bath from an object uh, which emitted that light just 1.3 billion years after uh, the, uh, the Big Bang. So boring objects to look at in many ways, but I think still quite awesome in their own right because they are the most dramatic objects probably in the universe and, you, and an amateur can look at them if he wants to. Anyway, so that's all I've got to say. You stay? Yeah. Any questions? What size telescope are you using for the um, photos that you took? That's a, a four and a half inch uh, reflector. It's, a, it's one of those automated telescopes which has got a sort of yeah, imaging yeah, kit. Yeah. At the prime yeah. focus. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they're, they're all on the interstellar, are they? No, they're not. Um, no, no. Uh, you have to look up the coordinates and uh, plunk them in directly. But yeah, once you know the coordinates, you can point it at it. But the images are captured on the interstellar. Oh, yeah, the images are captured yeah, on there. Right. Yeah, so right. the same. And for example, that double quasar, I mean, they're quite easy to cut uh, in, in quite short exposures. I think you can you can see the double quasar in about three or four minutes exposure. Wow. Yeah. Pretty often. Uh, none of those exposures are more than about 10 minutes. I mean, all you want to show is a 16 magnitude dot, <laughs> nothing extended. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, probably not that hard to imaging them. Slightly off topic, so the limited, it's a sort of limited magnitude for the interstellar thing, and you're obviously depending on the observatory. Yeah, well, uh, like, like as far as I can tell, it's down to about five, the faintest things I see about magnitude 17 and a half. Wow. Uh, but I'm doing that by comparison, for example, the Stellaria Monrhein Atlas, which will show you objects yeah. down to about magnitude 17 and a half, 18, right. roughly by comparison. Uh, and again, I've probably done the double exposures more than about 20 or 30 minutes looking for yeah. deep sky objects like that. Yeah. Pretty good though. It's not bad for, you know, again, from a city centre location. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, That's pretty impressive. But I think dots are not actually that hard to image in many ways. It's mm -hmm. extended objects which are always a challenge because in many ways they're yeah. fainter than you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, so I'll, I'll do a whistle stop. It's, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to break a, a, a tradition, but I'll keep it. I'll keep it quick. It's been sitting around for four years or so. Anyway, um, so uh, effectively, I just want to show you what I've been up to for the last year as um, a STEM ambassador. So anyone could be a STEM ambassador. Uh, you go on a course. Uh, Merrick's been on the course. Um, you fill in some paperwork. You get a form. You get EDBS checked. Funny people phone you up, um, but then you're allowed in schools. That's kind of cool. And uh, this is what I've been, this is all of my badge. This will get a little, once you get become a STEM ambassador, you get onto the learning portal, you get registered and it tells you um, how many organizations you've been to over the last year, how many activities, how many hours you've done um, and how many uh, school kids that you've actually uh, bored to death or inspired. Yeah. Um, and you get pages and pages. So uh, in some ways it's a, um, a lot uh, of sort of just recording stuff, but it, that website actually gives teachers access to you. So they can go hunting. I, I want someone who knows about the color of Dulux paint. I don't want someone who does stuff with cars. I want someone who does stuff with space. And this is how, so how on earth do I get into, well, it's actually well over uh, 30 schools. It's because they've come in via this portal to try and find someone. Um, so I've been all over the place, got, Dots all over the place, uh, for quite a bit of travel. I don't know why I became very popular in sales, uh, Salisbury um, over the last year or so. Um, but we do this stuff at, in the evening. We, we even bring, so that's a 300, uh, 500 quid telescope. He's standing on there, mm -hmm. uh, but needs must to be able to go and see Saturn and Jupiter. Um, but we've all been taking the mobile planetarium out um, we've got that quite sort of sussed now. I, I'll go out solo to a school to run that. Uh, Roger helps out. Um, so we've got, this is, I'm trying to remember where this was. This is in Broome. So we set all the solar telescopes up and we basically had a solar afternoon. So instead of doing um, stargazing, they did the stargazing, um, which is fun and getting the kids looking through the Coronado and explaining how to safely look at and enjoy the whole of their sort of universe because it belongs to them as well as everyone else. Um, and then taking the gravity well out and uh, sort of teaching them a little bit about how to envisage how it all works. Um, so they can bring a, their, the solar system into their classroom, which is kind of fun. But of course, what normally happens is these marbles end up all over the classroom and they're finding them. And the next year I go in, they'll give me a bag of marbles that they've, they've discovered from uh, the gravity well exercise. But you can see the excitement and fascination in people's faces. Um, it is fun, but they're also learning stuff about orbits when they're playing with it. Um, and we've also got all the rocket launching. So um, I, I built the rocket launcher. That rocket launcher has launched so many thousands of rockets. And we've got the new controller, which actually speaks to you and plays music and stuff. Um, uh, I thought it was indestructible, but I gave Roger uh, it. And uh, it wasn't indestructible, but I've amended it now. So that's fine. Um, and just the simplest things, getting um, cubs and scouts and things to do uh, constellation shapes. And once they get the hang of that, just get a few of them to step back and think about the distances to stars. And the simplest activities, but just getting them to think about it and uh, imagine them in a bigger world. And then you just get them to run around and make crazy patterns and things and photos. That's kind of cool. And uh, we've got Steve here. Um, and I think this is Farnborough. Uh, when we took over the entire school. So was it five of us took over a school and did all the lessons? Um, so that was kind of fun in November, wasn't it? Do you want to do that again? We practiced doing one day how the teachers did it. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of simple uh, experiments like making their own spectroscopes and looking and uh, just looking at the lights in their classroom, which they just saw as lights before. But after we've been in there, they can see that their lights are made up of different chemical, uh, different elements, just using a CD and a piece of A4, two bits that they had in their classroom. But now they've discovered actually their lights are actually made of more than they ever thought. Um, so just doing special stuff like that. And uh, this has been quite a success mm -hmm. over the uh, autumn term. Um, this is our uh, little box, um, which contains a gravity well, all, all the bits and pieces, um, uh, telescopes, what else is in there? We've got a thing called a tellarium, which shows you the seasons, uh, how the phases of the moon. It's a 300, piece, uh, 300 pound piece of kit, which schools wouldn't afford but they can borrow it for free. I've 
done a lot of carting it around. It's quite heavy, as my back has discovered, um, but it's been really popular. Now, most of the space is done uh, in the autumn term, so it's actually quiet now, but we basically, uh, we had a, a, a queue for that. So uh, fingers crossed coming up next year as well, that'd be equally good. And we've got our write-ups as well. Uh, I get to be famous in the uh, Bath Parent magazine. I was in it twice last year. Yeah. Um, and you get moments like this where sort of, uh, <laughs> the lazy ones, I don't know. Um, but actually to, to be part of that and um, to have everyone excited and talking about astronomy and then getting uh, letters like that back. It's sort of like not only you're getting the reward of seeing people being inspired in the classroom, but they're also saying thank you as well. That's it. Thank you very much. And you can become a STEM ambassador too. Uh, stem.org.uk. But that's it for this evening. Thank you for, uh, very much for coming along. Uh, are you dragging people to the pub? Okay. Um, so which one is it, Griffin? Griffin? Okay, so if you'd like to go to the pub, the Griffin Inn is open. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah.